Um, good afternoon and welcome to um, the second in our series of remote family law seminars. Um, I'm Sean Smith. I'm here with Gemma Taylor QC and Adam Dillon. Um, we're all family law barristers and in Anne's case, also a family mediator at 42 Bedford Row. Um, and importantly for this evening, the vice chair of the National Association of Child Contact Centres. Um, we are also very pleased to be joined today by Sir James Munby, uh, Elizabeth Coe and Philip Coleman, um, who will be discussing with Anne uh, issues impacting on child contact and contact centres during this lockdown and beyond. Um, just a couple of bits of housekeeping before we start. Um, after the talk, there'll be about, which will be about 30 minutes, uh, we'll have some time for some questions. So if you have any questions, I'm going to invite you to use uh, the Q&A function. You should find it down the bottom of your screen. And if you click on that, you can type in your questions. And uh, Gemma and I will put some, if not all of them, um, to our panel uh, after the talk. And just a reminder that the webinar has been recorded and it will be available on our Chamber's YouTube channel um, after today. So now I'm going to hand over to Anne. Um, he'll tell you a little bit about the National Association of Child Contact Centres um, and introduce you to each of our guests. Thanks, Sean. So in England and Wales, child contact centres and services are run by a range of charities, independent organisations and local authorities. And 350 of these form the National Association of Child Contact Centres, known as NAC. NAC centres facilitate families who self-refer, who are in free proceedings, who are in private family law cases and in public family law cases. NAC's work also involves accreditation, which is overseen by an independent standards panel, which monitors, reviews and updates the accreditation standards by which the centres operate. We accredit around 350 centres across England and Wales. And these centres are run by 3,500 volunteers and 1,000 staff. And this enables around 20,000 children each year to see the parents and families they know along with. Um, I'm delighted this afternoon to be, um, be joined in the seminar by, as um, Sean's already said, Elizabeth, Philip and Sir James. So Elizabeth is the Chief Executive of NAC and she was currently previously, she was, sorry, she was previously um, Director of CAFCAS for London and she's on the Private Law Working Group. Philip Coleman is NAC's um, Development Services Manager. He has um, a background in local authority social work and also worked at NSPCC where he continues as a volunteer for their Childline service. James, I know, needs very little introduction to this audience. As a former president of the Family Division, he now chairs the Nuffield Justice Observatory. And he's here this afternoon in his capacity as president of NAC. So I began by asking how child contact centres are responding to the pandemic, pandemic. Well, as you can imagine, on the 24th of March, when we were asked to, when we were lockdown was brought in, it was first of all a panic um, about what was, what was going to happen because they knew they would all have to, co to close down. Um, parents phoning um, about what they were going to do about their contact. And so it made us really think very hard about how we were going to take things forward. We did know that one or two centres already did some virtual contact because they had some uh, parent who lived abroad. So they'd managed to facilitate some contact virtually with uh, parents in that situation. But we decided that we would have a look at um, developing an app because most of the apps that are available like Zoom and Teams, uh, the parents have to give their, or they would have to give their own personal information. And we thought that in certain, some circumstances, that some parents just wouldn't want to do that. So in developing um, a Skype app, it gave us the opportunity to um, avoid that. And it would mean that the centres actually sent the invitation to the parents we recommended that the parents got themselves their own email address just for virtual contact so that there was no crossover, no difficulty, no problems um, in terms of, uh, say, of, of information. Um, the other safeguards that we put in place were also that um, there was a facility to be able to mute the app so that 
if parents were saying things that they shouldn't, um, and that would be in the house where the children were the resident parents, or the uh, non-resident parent was saying things that were inappropriate, then the worker could actually mute them. Um, and so uh, they uh, were pretty sure that things were going to be much um, clearer and better for the child. Um, I'm going to go over to Phil now because he's dealt with mainly the referrals and the risk assessment and the pre-visits. Okay, so where we are at at the moment is that we recognise that many of the families and indeed the contact centres using this technology would be unfamiliar with it and how it works and that therefore there may be concerns about how um, people would be kept safe, about how they would feel comfortable, about how this would be an app that is as safe as the services they are used to. Um, so what we've done as an organisation is put a range of guidance together that's all available through our website that guides people through the process of setting up this technology and using it in a safe and effective way. The referral process that we currently have in place looks much like a referral process that um, would easily be recognised from how contact services have worked in the past. So information would come to a contact centre, they would write out their um, initial risk assessment based on the information they received, they would make contact with the relevant parties, confirm that information and think about how they would manage those risks and what those risks would look like. Once, they, once they've got a clear sense of that, they would then be able to go on to the pre-visit process where they could look at forming a contact agreement which would set out what parents and children can expect from the contact service or what the contact service would expect from them in return in order to ensure this is a service that works for everybody. Um, so the, in short, the, the referral process is much like any referral process that they would have followed in terms of offering a service. And, Therefore, we can be confident that it is robust and that we're not placing people at harm as a result of, of using this technology for child content. Right. So, what are, what are the most important observed from the changes that have been introduced? Maybe I can invite any, all of you to, to, to contribute to that if you like. I mean, Philip, do you want to? Yeah. So, what, what we've observed so far is that centres have really been able to adjust to this kind of new normal. Uh, like Elizabeth says, though, there was this kind of cliff edge moment whereby they weren't able to offer face-to-face -face services anymore. And very, very quickly, our members came around to looking at how we can meet the needs of children, what that will look like. Uh, if you'd have asked me six months ago, that's not something that I would have predicted would have been possible. Uh, however, it's been amazing what our members have been able to put together and how they've been able to really push themselves and test themselves to ensure that we are getting services out there to the children and families that need us most right now. Right. Um, I mean, so James, I mean, one of the things that I feel I've, I've observed is that there's a greater cross-sector <laughs> working. I don't know if that's an experience that you've been aware of. I think in this sense, I mean, I'm slightly an outside observer, so I keep my finger on the pulse by following the bloggers, particularly the legal bloggers, but also the social work bloggers, and social media. And I think one of the consequences of this crisis we've been going through is that there's been much more conversation um, online, in blogs, between the different uh, players in the family justice system. Um, and people have got used to escaping from their little professional finals um, and are now familiar with the idea of uh, in starting conversations, joining in conversation. Many of those conversations, I have the impression, both on blogs and in social media, um, are much more uh, cross-professional, uh, much more all-embracing than were the similar conversations before the present crisis. Mm -hmm. It's true to say it's it's true to say as well that we had a lot of uh, multi-organisation meetings with people like Cathcas, One Plus One, um, Childline, uh, all sorts of people, just talking to them and, and, and mediation services, just talking to them about what they're doing, what Nat's doing, um, and also making sure that they put their the information on their websites as we put their information on our websites, whatever new stuff that they're doing because of the COVID. Right. 
So, so James, what are your thoughts on the rapid increase in the and the use of digital technology you know, keep, for keeping children in touch with their families? Well, I've got, I suppose, four points which range from the general to the more particular. Uh, the first point is the, the idea that when this crisis is over, what I might call the post-COVID world, is simply going to revert to the pre-COVID normality. I think it is completely misconceived. Um, we are going to be in a new world. For those who simply say it's back to business, but don't get the picture. Um, the second point I'd make is this, that under the force uh, of this crisis, um, we have had a crash learning course, uh, if I might put it that way, in digital possibilities. And we've seen that, I suppose, in four different areas. First, in the way in which the courts move. Right? Secondly, in the context of events such as this, um, which never took on the crisis, and are now rapidly during the crisis, facing the more traditional seminar or face-to-face -face gathering. Um, thirdly, it's had an enormous impact the way in which charities and other third set organizations, including NAC, uh, provide services, disseminate information, and provide support. Fourthly, it's had a great impact on the personal family level, as we've all tended to experience under the crisis of conditions we live in. We are now much more familiar than most of us were a few weeks ago with platforms like Zoom, and we're now much more familiar than we were so very recently with having regular chat conversations with members of our families. And for those who can grapple with the technology, getting surprisingly large family gatherings together or participating in the one Zoom uh, event. I think the third point I'd make is that we've got to take advantage of all this experience by the learn in order to have a much more nuanced and subtle between ourselves as to what the post COVID digital world would be like. And in that connection, we have got to avoid the excesses and the extravagances which hitherto have been characterized as a polarized field on the one side, those I might be digital enthusiasts whom everything should be digital, and against, on the other side, those who I call the Luddites, take view that nothing should be digital. And I think that the fourth point coming closer to home, closer to the topic of this seminar, is we've got to seize this as an opportunity to make the most of all that learning we require as to the reality to come up with some new things in relation to best content, which are is all about keeping children in contact with parents, other members of their family, with whom they're not living, with whom therefore they're not interacting face to face on a daily basis. And uh, without any straight points to take up later in this discussion, we, as indeed has been made clear by the court, really heard, it is now becoming obvious that there's enormous tension in the context of contact, in the context of contact for a more uh, digital approach in future. It's interesting, isn't it, that the um, that the there were there were two reports produced um, last week um, by the observatory, um, and it seems looking at those that quite a few of the sort of the findings um, very much chime with our own experience on the ground. Um, Philip and Elizabeth, I wonder if you would agree with that. Yes, absolutely. There's, at the National Association of Child Contact Centres, we've been taking our time to carefully look over the findings of those reports that have been put together and to make sense of what that means for the children and families that use our services. Um, and for the sake of being nice and succinct today, I'll, I'll just highlight three of the points that were brought out in that report. So there was one that said digital contact is more immediate, less formal, and can help to facilitate relationships. That's something that we would support at NAC. We see that digital contact has a strong place amongst a package of other contact services. Um, those, those children and families that have always enjoyed face-to-face -face contact, that there is still a place for that. And this, 
digital control shouldn't replace that, but it can be used to prepare children or it can be used for those children whereby face-to-face -face contact just wouldn't have been possible in the past. In terms of it being less formal and helping to facilitate relationships, we know that um, digital contact can take place anywhere. So it can take place in a child's home where they've got their toys around them, where they feel natural, safe and secure. And it can be a less formal environment because a, a supervisor who might typically have been sat in the room in the past writing notes is now the other side of a computer screen and they can even turn off their monitor so that they're still observing and seeing, but they're not necessarily seen by the other parties. Yeah. Another finding that they kind of come up with a recommendation that they made was that digital contact should be used to enhance face-to-face -face contact rather than to um, replace it. And that, I think, was largely covered in the last point that I made. Digital contact has a place in preparing children, in um, supporting with life story work, with children that are experiencing adoption or post-adoption. Uh, it has a place, a package of resources, but we, we wouldn't want to see it um, remove face-to-face -face contact because what face-to-face -face contact brings in terms of emotional warmth, cuddles, eye contact, being able to get on the floor with a child, lots of those things are either not possible or much less easy or natural in, in that um, virtual environment. The third recommendation was that the form of digital contact should be adapted to the age and developmental stage of the, of the young person. Uh, and again, that's something that we would support. We, there's been lots of questions and really helpful conversation about how much babies get from virtual contact and, and whether it's in their best interests to facilitate it or whether we meet the needs of the parents by doing that. And I think the, the jury's still out. That's something that's still being explored and looked at. But we know that certainly with older children, they've grown up with this technology in their lives and, and they are very um, clever at being able to find their way around a variety of apps and, and making that really work for them. So, yeah, I think that's, they're, they're the three main points that I took from those that I thought would be most helpful today. And I think the other thing is that um, for some children, they don't have huge, tra huge distances to travel very, on a regular basis. You think about places like Wales, where to be able to get to one side of Wales, you have to come down and go back up again. So it's a whole day to try and get contact. Now, that might be fine once every three months, but you need, I think children need contact more often than that, if it's all possible. Um, and also, just one example um, is of uh, how, video, how video contact helped a young girl who was having contact with her mother. She lived with her father in contact with her mother, and she'd had two, two sessions of contact virtually with her mother and she was due to have a third and she and her mother died um, and one of the things that I think the feedback from the pair from the father um, and also from other parents is actually she would not have, have been had the opportunity to speak to her mother had we not been able to facilitate um, virtual contact and we've had some parents who've said that it's been an absolute lifeline for them because they were dis desperate that they their contact was stopping um, and to be able at least to have some kind of contact was really helpful. Do you think it would be helpful or just maybe they already exist um, for, um, for parents um, and others um, to, to have some help in preparation for some of these? Um, for, for when they're having meetings online. I, I think, um, Phil, you mentioned that the um, National Association of Child Contact Centres has a resource pack. Is, is that right? Yeah, we have a whole suite of resources available on our website um, for our members, but for the general public too. So if you are a parent or a child and you know that you're going to be having virtual contact, for, for example, you could open up a document that's been put there especially for you and it guides you through some fun and friendly activities that you can use to really enrich that contact session to make the most of the time so that people don't feel worried about filling the time so that they're not um, sitting staring at each other through a screen and not knowing how to use that time. So there's support and resources available there for people should they, should they need that. So ideas about how to play with um, particularly little ones on screen. Well, I wasn't expecting them to sit there and talk to you. They're very useful. So there's a lot of expansion of virtual contact. And there's a lot going on in this area. 
one of the issues we must be concerned about is actually um, the standards. You know, are, are there going to be consistent standards across the board so that anybody providing um, contact is going to, you know, be, uh, to be subject to a, a, um, you know, the sort of uh, the sort of standards that the our independent standards board um, uh, provides at the moment. Yes, we. Um to be able to make sure we maintain standards, of course, we need to review our current standards and be able to put some guidance in for centres, um, in addition to what we've already provided, um, because we see this, we see virtual contact as, as being an indefinite thing. I don't think it's just for um, whilst this virus is, is uh, rampant, it's for, I think, um, forever. It's an additional service for centres. So we need to make sure that we give good guidance on the sort of things that they should be doing. Um, and then we uh, we have the Independent Standards Board that actually reviews our accreditation reports so that they will make sure that we uh, stick to the sort of guidance and um, things that we've been saying that we should in our reports, uh, our assessors' reports. And then we've got uh, the All-Party Parliamentary Group on, um, on services, on contact services. Um, we've been raising awareness with MPs, but we also need to go back to them and start to uh, discuss with them the new, the new normal, the new world in terms of virtual, um, when they're talking to their constituents to be able to make sure that they can tell them that that's available to them. And then, of course, there's the amendment to the domestic violence bill um, that is uh, we're waiting to present to um, the yeah. uh, committee stage now, isn't it? At the committee stage, yes. So um, I, I think there's quite a lot around the standards. Um, and, and going back to um, our kind of reopening, there'll be quite a lot of. Uh, stuff that we need to tell centres about reopening, about how they're going to uh, make sure the premises are clean, make a decision about how many families they should have at any one time, how they're going to maintain social distancing, because I think that can be with us for a long time. Um, to be saying to children, please bring your own toys instead of um, having the centre toys because we don't have to clean them if you're taking them away with you. So we're going to... Um, also, I think we've got to remember that some of the centres won't all open up immediately because we've got a lot of older people who are involved in centres and, and they do a great job, um, but they are in a risk group. So we've got to be uh, cautious about how, how uh, they do it. Um, and our safety measures, which we're currently designing and a risk assessment tool, um, which we've put, in, we've put in place, probably needs a bit more work. Um, between Phil and I, but uh, we've got um, a draft of something that we will send to centres that they will use as a, a as a tick tick off questionnaire. And um, we're taking advice from the um, teachers' unions about how they're going to approach it because um, there are similarities with contact centres. Yes, thank you. So, so finally, um, so James, what do you think should be the family justice system's direction of travel in relation to keeping in touch, children in touch with their families in the, in the post-COVID world? Well, very shortly, um, and I don't treat myself as being either one of the enthusiasts, certainly not one of the lovers. We need to make more use uh, of the technology which we've now discovered, uh, means that digital contact can be very, very effective. Yes. As in all things, we've got to find the right balance. Recognised in an ideal world, contact is obviously the best. But equally recognising, it seems to me, uh, that there'll be many circumstances in which face to face contact uh, is not feasible or may not even be appropriate. The vital need for all contact arrangements is to establish, improve, and maintain a relationship between children and uh, adults when they can't live together. Uh, once upon a time, uh, that was seen in very simplistic ways of terms. It was either direct contact face to face, or was indirect contact, which meant sort of birds and birds and birthday cards. Oh. What we've been rather slow to appreciate until this crisis has given us 
is that modern technology means that there are other ways, ways which more closely approximate uh, to face-to-face -to -face contact than to traditional indirect contact. That is the tremendous advantage of modern digital systems. And what we've got to do, uh, it seems to me, subject always to make sure that parents and others have the right kit and that we're using the appropriate digital platform. Uh, we've got to make much, we've got to make use of digital arrangements wherever they are appropriate. Uh, and this is not a one size fits all, as in most things in family justice and family life. Uh, these things have got to be tailored to circumstances and needs of the particular families. Um, and one needs to recognize, this has been touched on already. Uh, that there may be certain times where frequent regular contact is simply not possible. If the children and the adults are living in separate countries or on different continents or, or even far apart, um, then face to face contact may mean, as uh, Elizabeth has suggested, once every three months. Yes. The great advantage of digital is you can do it almost every day if you want to. <laughs> um, and um, that's why digital is something to be welcomed uh, in appropriate cases. In some cases, it could largely be a substitute for face to face contact, which is impossible because of geographical se separation. In other cases, as Philip has suggested, this will be um, an add on to face to face contact where we can use the two in sequence altogether. And I think in analyzing these issues and thinking about these issues, um, one needs to bear one or two realities in mind. First of all, children, even the very youngest children, are growing up with, and are familiar with a world where the screen is all important. Um, those of us sitting around in this discussion think we're familiar with the digital world. Uh, on one level we are, we came to it uh, more or less in the adult mind. Uh, even the youngest children now um, are growing up in a largely digital world where their first point, or this is a good thing or a bad thing, uh, is the screen rather than the book or the television. And we need to think about this because if children are used to interacting uh, with their favorite characters or with their relatives on the screen, then from their point of view, uh, online digital contact may be a um, more, more familiar idea, going off to some strange place, meeting off to strange people. But I think we need to think about this from the children's perspective, and realize their perspective probably very different from the modern digital world we live in, than the perspectives uh, of many practitioners. Uh, secondly, of course, we need to be conscious of the fact even for those who are not separated by the ocean by hundreds of miles, the cost of getting uh, to a contact center or to other arrangements of Facebook contact may be very considerable. The uh, cost of uh, those sitting around this table getting to a contact center, whether by bus or taxi or car, is probably not that great. It would be fairly easily accommodated within our um, comfort budgets. But for many, many people, living in less advanced circumstances. The cost of getting to a contact center or contact is very significant. Um, and so significant, the data itself tends to diminish the number of times of the place. And that really is going to the third point, which has really been touched both what I've said by what Philip has said. Uh, digital contact can take place much more frequently uh, in a sense, in a much more informal and natural uh, than does traditional close contact at contact center. But I think the frequency of contact is terribly important because if you're not living um, with your, your grandchildren, if they're not living with their parents or their grandparents, they're going to have a much better relationship, much closer relationship, much more natural relationship with those absent adults. I used to talk to them frequently by Zoom or something. And if they see them 
once every three months or so in some artificial setting. I think the frequency point is terribly important. And that's, I think, one of the trade-offs for that very carefully coming to the right balance. Is the frequency and the informality um, and the naturalness of uh, by visual me. Something which, in the case, in cases generally, counterbalances the disadvantage. Although you're seeing people, or actually face to face with three months. But those, I think, are important questions. And they're the kind of points we think we can indicate. There's a real future, much more than we previously experienced in the past. And thus far, the lessons of what is happening on the ground, these extraordinary times and difficult, do tend to support Well, thank you very much for that. There we go. Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much for that uh, really interesting discussion. I'm sorry it's ended quite abruptly. Uh, my name's Gemma Taylor, and I want to formally and um, profusely thank Sir James, Elizabeth, and Philip for contributing to this fast moving discussion about managing contact in lockdown and how much we have to learn about the effects of digital contact now and in the future and also to Anne in particular for organising this event. Um, we're very grateful that you have agreed to answer a few questions from our audience. Um, some of you have already sent questions in, they've been answered already uh, in writing, others will be addressed now, but if you haven't sent a question in, please do so now. Um, however, I'd like to start with one from me because I have the advantage of having seen this talk already. And I went away, um, and this is addressed to Philip or Elizabeth, so please decide between you. Uh, who you'd like to answer this. Um, I went to, away and read the Nuffield Observatory Rapid Evidence Review on the effects of digital contact on children's well-being. And, and one of the problems identified is that it can be difficult for carers and professionals to set boundaries and supervise digital contact. Can you please explain a bit more fully how your professionals plan for and manage these issues? Over so, to Philip or Elizabeth. I'll go, to, I'll go to Philip because he's been dealing with the centres directly who've been doing this. Thank you very much. Lovely. So the, generally the approach that we take when supporting professionals and family members is to recognise that this type of contact um, can be quite difficult and can have its problems because it's new to us all and we're all kind of learning. And we tend to recommend that you prepare professionals. We know that, for example, foster carers have found getting used to using this technology very difficult, um, not only in terms of actually being able to use the technology, but also having um, cameras in their home and, and all the anxieties around that. Um, so there's a real role there for supervising social workers to work with those foster carers to overcome those difficulties, to look at those risk assessments, and to prepare them fully for the service that's about to take place because ultimately we know it's, it's going to be a key role of that um, foster carer to be able to support the child to engage in the process and it's the child that really matters in amongst all of this. In a more formal sense, we tend to work with um, more so the adults and the professionals that are going to be using the technology to we will have a pre-visit to start off with, whereby we will test out the technology. We will talk about the rules, what people can expect, what they can expect from us. And then we will formalise those things in a working agreement. Uh, we call it a, a contact agreement, but it's basically a working agreement so that everybody has some thinking writing to refer back to about what we've agreed, how it will work, and how we will make sure that the best interests uh, of children are constantly met throughout the process. But it is um, a very supportive, nurturing process where people need to be guided and mentored along the way to, to make it all work for children. Thank you very much. Um, I think Sean has the next question. Uh, thank you. Yes, um, this uh, question is going to be for James, if I can. 
Um, you were talking about um, observing conversations beginning um, between the players, as it were, in the family justice system um, and how we're stepping out or perhaps need to step out of our um, professional silos. Um, social media obviously does well across professional boundaries, but is limited to those who use it as an obvious point. How, how do you think that um, some of those professional lessons are going to be shared and, and learned or ought to be moving forward? Well, one of the interesting things I've detected monitoring this is that many of the viewpoints, many of the experiences, whatever the professional background of those recording them, are very similar. And what is interesting is that this process of online discussion, uh, this process of a almost continuous digital debate that we're having now, is very rapidly uh, bringing consensus on issues, very rapidly uh, bringing people together to recognize what is or is not sensible. Uh, critically, of course, it is dependent upon the technology. Um, and just because many of us are more or less digitally literate, more or less digitally equipped, we have to remember that there are many people who are not part of the digital family, people who are not comfortable with this. Whatever we do in any professional context has got to be very receptive and understanding of that. But in terms of the professional conversation, in terms of the conversations between different kinds of professionals, almost all professionals nowadays are by and large technically literate, Almost all professionals nowadays are provided uh, by their employers or agencies with more or less effective kit um, and are, for that reason, if nothing else, uh, quite familiar with this. Uh, I think this is a learning process. One of the things which we may be putting into emerge from this is a better understanding of just how far one can use digital and what the limitations are. And... Um, it's a terrible thing in the sense that said one of the advantages we're going to reap in the long term, this terrible crisis we're going through, is that we have had what I call this crash course, uh, compressing into as many weeks, but otherwise we're taking years to understand where we're going. Um, and if our view is reasonably positive, uh, if we recognise, as we must, that we are still on a big learning curve. Um, and that uh, our approach is going to be uh, onwards and upwards at a sensible, measured pace, then we are going to derive enormous benefits from this. What I hope is that quite apart from anything else, when we get back to the post-COVID normal, that is not a normal where we all retreat to our individual professional silos, where the experience we've had in these recent weeks are really quite extraordinary conversations and discussions media and on the blogs and become a settled part of the family justice system for the future. Um, and um, inevitably the nature of things, judges are not part of that moment and why that should be. But with that uh, exception, almost everybody else in the family justice system is participating in this. And the more who do so, the better. Thank you. Jenna? So James, just following up from that, if I may, you've said that we need to, to learn from what uh, we're finding from the current situation and uh, the use of technology can be extremely effective. We're coming out of our silos. We've learned very quickly, turned things around and learning on the job. But moving forward post-COVID, um, if it were up to you, what body uh, would you suggest should take this uh, movement forward so that there is really uh, much more effective liaison between all of these uh, resources? Well, the family justice system has an enormous strength compared to the other justice system. Mm -hmm. It has a long tradition of interdisciplinarity, a long tradition of all the players recognising uh, That gives us an enormous advantage if you compare us with either the criminal justice system or the civil justice system. And the simple fact is that anybody who is an active participant in the family justice system, in whatever context, very quickly learns who all the players are. Um, and um, if you go to conferences, seminars, you 
RPH breaking, this sort of thing. Um, there's a strength of the system, not of criticism. You see the same faces. And by and large, what we've done so far is to get where we are without a very strong top-down leadership. Um, I think leadership in this context is a matter of persuasion, not a matter of vocation. Uh, that said, and you might think, and uh, others may think, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Um, ultimately, I think it's important to remember that the president of family is actually the head of family justice. Uh, that does not give the president the power to tell people what to do, even given, given the power to tell his judges what to do, his judges are independent. But it does give the president a tremendous role as a leader, as someone who, who can encourage and who by diplomacy and persuasion can move things in the right direction. For my own part, I'd be reluctant to see some very organized system uh, moving all this forward because that will become immensely bureaucratized. And you'd have enormous issues in the who should be on the um, and thus far, my experience of the family justice system, um, to which I've been very close, appreciate for at least the last few years, is that we don't need that. And um, I think that uh, we can see as things have developed uh, without being invidious. Uh, Mr. Justin Bonnell, for example, being a key figure on the judicial front, he has taken the initiative under the issue uh, to keep on churning out and updating the guidance which is coming for practitioners from the judges. The president has been taking a very active role, and one can, all th one can think of others, just as one can think of others uh, in the, they want to say, the political context, in the ministerial context, um, in local governments, and so forth. So I think um, if there's a shared will to move this forward, uh, that shared will, I think, and I certainly hope and believe, um, will uh, move us forward in the right direction without becoming bogged down in too much organization and bureaucracy. And um, if I can utter a slight heresy, one of the things which would concern me in terms of moving forward on the digital front is if it becomes too bureaucratized, too organized, we may find movement forward, as I would hope, in relation to the family justice system, being held back uh, by more cautious authorities uh, who might predominate in either the criminal justice system or civil justice. I think in many ways, and I've talked about myself, I think in many ways for many years, now, over the decades, family justice has shown that it can move forward under its own initiatives in a much more effective way, in a much more speedier way, Way which is much more effective of what society needs, either the civil justice or the criminal justice system. So I'd be slightly reluctant to have this new bureaucracy. The idea that this will all end up with working parties and minutes in the agenda with a certain amount of horror. But that said, I can imagine others may take away different view. Thank you, Sir James. Sean. Um, thank you. I'm going to um, pose, I think, a two, two questions as one to Philip, if I may. Um, the first is whether um, the experience of remote contact has mainly been in a supervised or supported uh, setting um, as things have gone so far. And um, as a second part, whether you've considered or... Um, what the impact might be on the capacity of contact centres where they've been providing supported contact um, and uh, providing individual supervision of um, sorry I'm <laughs> someone's come off mute it distracted me slightly but um, so centres that are providing supported contact they have um, a few people supervising a number of families which together will be restricted in their capacity to provide contact sessions uh, if they're taking place um, on this remote app oh, sorry that's difficult to follow isolate immediately and get yourself a test can i can i just 
just Let's ask that, that everyone uh, mute their microphone because I feel that we may have the government's the coronavirus briefing uh, playing somewhere in the background. That's Thank bad. you. We, we got Zoom bombed by the government there, I believe. <laughs> So yeah, I'll, I'll uh, do my best to answer that question. I might need you to just remind me of the second part. But where we are at at the moment is that we do have a mixture of centres that are delivering this. Um, predominantly, it's our supervised services that have been um, certainly the quickest in getting services set up and running that are safe and effective. Our supported services have achieved very similar um, it's maybe taken them a bit longer, but we, we do now have that spread of supervised and supported services doing this. And equally, our partners in different local authorities, I, I know it's very patchy, but different local authorities have now been able to adapt and look at their offering in terms of the role that technology can play in child contact. And just, just remind me, Sean, what was the second part of your question, sorry? Before you move yeah, on, sorry. I've got some numbers there, if anybody's interested in numbers, um, in terms of centres that have, uh, in, in terms of the division, in terms of, there's 20, 36 supervised centres that are doing tech, and there's um, 11, 22 supported centres, with the rest moving towards doing some. Sorry, no, not at all. That's that's really interesting. Um, the second part was just to ask really whether there's an impact on capacity for supported centres because on the remote basis they can only support one family at a time, whereas on face to face sessions they'd be supporting a number of families at the same time. Yeah, that, it's a really interesting question and one that isn't entirely straightforward to answer. Um, potentially yes you are right in what you're saying they can only work with one family at a time and I suspect that the issues around getting the technology set up making sure that people have got the right app at the right time and that they're all on it that's that's all going to be quite time consuming for them however what we're finding is that one of the benefits of this type of contact is that they're able to offer services throughout the week um, because it, it fits in around people's lives. It can be organised really well. Whereas um, typically a lot of supported centres tend to limit their services to the weekend. And particularly with children not being at school at the moment, the, the availability of families is much more than it ever has been. So whilst there is a potential issue there that's apparent, um, it's not an issue that has caused any problems so far. There is plenty of capacity in the system to be able to meet the level of demand that's out there. Thank you, that's really reassuring. Um, Gemma? Thanks. I think we'll just have um, one further question from me and one further question from Sean, so everyone um, understands. So I'm going to just... Um, this is to Elizabeth. It's a rolled up, again, two questions in, in one. And um, firstly, how far have NAC got uh, to... Uh, towards reopening at any of the centres and uh, when is it likely that um, advice will be forwarded to the contact centres about reopening arrangements? Practical right. issues being raised by um, our participants. Yes, um, in fact I've answered on the chat line one of those questions but okay. uh, just, just for everybody else. Um, a lot of the centres are very, very anxious to get opening on the basis that a lot of schools or some schools will be opening, certainly in the age range that a lot of our children would be, like um, four or five-year-olds. Um, and so they are thinking uh, they want to desperately open and they wanted to do it next week, but we have said no, the, uh, the actual advice is not yet uh, because we need to get the advice of what schools are doing in terms of um, how many children they can have, how they're going to go on a cleaning regime. So that's why we've drafted a questionnaire for centres to look at about how they're going to do these things. And the sort of things that they need to look at are um, 
they have lots of toys around. Well, there's no point in having toys around because after every child has been in, they can't be cleaning the toys. So one of the suggestions is that the children should bring their own toys and take them away again so they haven't got to clean. That they actually only have um, one or two families in at a time for a shorter time than they would normally so that then they can keep them divided up and when they go, they can clean and then they can get the next family in. So we are starting to think about health them and giving them guidance about how they might do that but we are um, listening to Public Health England, the uh, schools unions about how they're actually doing it because they're very very similar in that they've got children running around and having to try and think about how they're going to keep a four or five year old social distancing because they want to play together and hug, hug each other. Thank um, you, thank you. Over to final question from Sean, thank you. Um, thank you. Yes. So final question um, I will ask of um, Sir James, which is just on the topic you were talking earlier about um, the importance, the benefits really of the frequency and the informality that remote contact can bring um, as opposed to the um, perhaps more obvious disadvantages. Understanding the overall impact of remote contact on relationships must be um, uncertain to some extent at this at this point. Um, do you see there being a role for research um, being carried out um, it, during this period and, and in the future to inform or better inform our decision making? My answer is an unequivocally enthusiastic yes. I'm not just saying that because I'm the chairman of the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory. We think that we have a lot of research in the family justice system, and it's true that we do. But the more we examine the research we've got, the more we recognize the enormous gaps in the research which is available to us. And indeed, part of the function of the observatory is to plug that gap. Uh, and one of the things I'm very keen about in specific is that the learning the experiences which we we're undergoing as part of this current crisis in all aspects of family justice, specifically in the context of contact arrangements, should be the, 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 should be the subject of constant monitoring as we're going along so we can gather a database of experience which can then be the basis of research. Because although it's terrible to think that this is happening because of an we must take the advantage of the crisis we've got. And that the crisis we're in is generating a vast amount of material, a vast amount of experience across the professional discipline. And one of the great advantages of all these professional conversations everybody's having is that that experience is actually being shared and gathered, even as we speak, uh, by all sorts of players, not just the observatory. And that is going to give us a huge amount of data, a huge amount of lived experience. Um, by a huge number of people, in a very short time, it must be the foundation of research. Uh, and uh, the, one of the paradoxes of research is the more we research, the more we begin to recognize how much more there is to research, how little we know about things. It seems to me that moving forward through the crisis and into the post-COVID world, um, we must not merely take advantage of all we've been experiencing in terms of improving the technology, in terms of improving the use of digital. We must also use it uh, to enhance our research database uh, to create new ways of thinking about what we should be doing in the future. And I think the combination of evaluation of what's happening on the technological uh, indirect uh, IT front and evaluation what's happening in terms of the experience uh, of families going through this crisis. If we put those two things together um, and have proper research and evaluation, that will stand us in very good stead at the end of the day. But research is absolutely vital. Um, the problem with research is there's so much we need. Uh, there are so few people actually are able to do it that we have to be rather choosy on what it is we can focus on. Uh, and my own approach, the approach of the Family Justice Observatory, is to mix our research, to do uh, small projects where you get 
use that awful expression of bang for your buck, where a small amount of research can actually generate quickly very, very important results. At the same time, we have got to do the more traditional long term, longitudinal research. Um, and it's a terrible thing in the sense to say, but for the research community, for the academic community, they're going to have years and decades where if they seize the opportunity being presented to learn lessons from this crisis we're going through. I mean, that is one reason why I only believe uh, that the post-COVID world is not going to be the pre-COVID world. The idea that we simply refer to the man of the day last year is not going to happen. It's not going to happen because people realise that the learning lessons all the time, identifying things which and that of itself, driven by research, makes change our world. And uh, all I can say is very much for the better. So, research, more research, more research, we can't have enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I think it now just comes to me to, um, it remains to me to thank you all for joining us um, today for the seminar. And particular thanks to our panellists, Sir James Mumby, Elizabeth Coe and Philip Coleman. Our next sem seminar is um, on Tuesday the 9th of June at 5pm when Sharon Baku, Bachu is a barrister at Unfortunately Bedford Row, and Sherma Polidor, family solicitor at Ventus, and Patricia Barry Ralph, who is an independent social worker, will be in discussion about parental alienation, the interface with public law proceedings. We look forward to seeing you all again then, and goodbye for now, and thanks again to our panellists. We're very grateful to you all. Bye.